Okay, so what else can you have questions? Any questions? I could, I could. Sure. You, uh, tell us, uh, look on that sheet or just uh, oh. questions from the crowd. Let's Hi. keep them going. Yeah. Hi, Lillian. Hi, Harry. That's great. Guess what? I can't spoil the book for you. Oh, okay. The return trip is in the book. Okay. Um, but but I, I, there was one question somebody brought up. Um, so I told you why I was disenchanted with things and why I decided to, you know, opt out. Um, why did I write the book? You know, when you're 24 and you're doing adventures, you don't think about, oh, I'll have to... Actually, we did. We, at one point we discussed, oh, we'll have to write a book someday. That goes right out the window with a 24-year-old. <laughs> but when my dad passed away, which was about seven years ago, he had a good long life. There was, he had a memoir that he wrote. It was, I found it, it was uh, legal pad, double space, Palmer method, uh, about something he did that helped change World War II. Very cool story. Anyway, I thought, oh, that's so cool. I, I should write my story. And I, I, I wrote about, I, I just sat down and just started the earliest memories. That I got 50 pages in and I went, ah, it's the bike trip. I have seven journals. I took, I have seven journals from the bike trip. Um, I would have brought them here today, but I left them at the office. <laughs> but they're like, they're voluminous. And I wrote every day. And so what I did is, is I sat down and, and uh, dictated those into uh, Dragon Dictate and Boom Mic, and that formed the basis of the book. It's about 415 pages. That took two and a half months. So six and a half or more years later, we have this. Okay, so it's so the first draft was two and a half months. The rest took all that time. But uh, it just got better. Uh, you know, I had help editing. I had my Rose here is in my writer's group. Uh, we have a memoir reading critique group. And you, you read every other week, and everyone critiques your writing. You read about five to eight pages. And it really helped me. I, 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 I'm a neophyte at this. I mean, I may have done other things in my life, but um, I've never been an author before. I went to the Southern California Writers Conference four years in a row. You go there. And, and most of you that know me know I'm not a timid person, but going to a place and late at night with people you don't know, they have these, they're called rogue read and critiques. They're early in the morning or late at night. And you go there and you sit around and you read 10 pages to complete strangers. And the first time I ever did this, my heart was in my throat. I felt like I was bearing my soul to complete strangers. What would they say? They were encouraging. So. I kept doing it. Anyway, um, there were some other questions. Maybe on the second turn of that clipboard, if you take the top seat off. So what kind of bikes and what gear? So we had, we had 10 speeds. And by the way, I think Carolyn has, what did we figure out, 21 speeds? You don't need that. 10 speeds are enough. If you look at study gearing ratios, 10 speeds is all you need. But back then, they barely come out with 12 speeds. They were steel framed bikes. And we could have gotten aluminum alloy bikes, but carrying 50 pounds of gear, uh, the people we bought the bikes from said, thought, you know, you ought to get a steel frame bike. Uh, that came with a little bit of baggage because at one point in the trip, my hands were like clubs. I couldn't even write a traveler's checklist like this uh, because of the nerve damage in here. Um, here, we kept minimal gear. Um, we spent a day and a half, after we thought we had just the gear we need, only the gear we need, we spent a day and a half and left, uh, left a day later than we planned just because we were winnowing out what do we absolutely have to have. We had a Svead stove, we had a new thing, brand new thing called a space blanket. <laughs> um, and we had a tent, but my roommate at the time, Henry, was a postman. He worked at the post office, and he said, you know, why don't you, like, why don't you ship your gear 
for the backpacking, ship it ahead, and it'll hold it for general delivery for 10 days. And what a brilliant idea. So we did that on the, in the national parks. And like from, you know, so uh, we shipped it to Front Royal, Virginia, and we used it through Shenandoah National Park, and we shipped it back, and then we picked it up in the Rockies and so on. Um, what else? The gear I told you about, yes. We had traveler's checks. And I, I should tell you, I don't want to spoil the whole book for you, but I, I sold my beloved 1950 Studebaker Champion in mint condition. I sold it to my brother-in-law, my twin sister's husband, for this trip. And I made money because antique cars, you know, they grow in value. Um, and he let me keep it to the day I left on the trip. So, but we had, no, we had uh, traveler's checks. That was it. This is, they may have had charge cards, but we didn't have charge cards then. So, uh, Sharon. Great question. That's not the first time that question's come up either. So we, we had a uh, one of those coil locks. I'm sorry. What did you do with your bikes when you went backpacking? We stashed them in the bushes. <laughs> At one point we did. Uh, we had one of those, you know those coil locks that the bike thieves can get through in a heartbeat? That's all we had. Um, but you know when you go camping, you know if you go camping and you go out for a day hike and you leave your tent, generally pretty safe. This is back in the uh, early 70s, so. But um, that's a good question. And at one point we did stash them in the bushes. Yeah, Rich? How padded was your seat from the beginning to the end? Well, we were, we were uh, schooled in this beforehand. We bought the bikes, I don't know if it was a year, it wasn't a year before the trip, but it was well before the trip. And we were counseled to, uh, we all had uh, Brooks B-17 leather saddles. So they're leather. And we were counseled to apply Neat's foot oil liberally so that it would fit. So the, so the bottom of the, the seat would contour to our, bot, our butts. Now I have to tell you, uh, I, after even after I sold that bike, and I won't say when that was, but after I sold that bike, I could not part with that saddle. Oh. I kept it, yeah. So, um, I have a question for you. Yes, so Kathy. So I loved all the botanical descriptions. You know the names of everything. Is that something you knew at the time, or did you have to research that later? Thanks for asking that. Okay, did you all hear the question? Okay, so I grew up outside in a place called Watsessing Park, and that's in the book, and it'll be in my next book as well. It's, um, it was a bucolic place. It was designed by the sons of Frederick Um And when I was little, we knew every tree and every bush. We didn't know their names, but we knew them intimately. I mean, the uh, arrow woods, Viburnum dentatum, you could whip crab apples with them, because that's what they made arrows out of. Uh, sassafras trees had mittens that looked like this. You know, they were this way, this way, or this way. Uh, we knew all these trees. That was before I went to school for landscape architecture. Then, when I went to school for landscape architecture, I got to learn botany, horticulture, phylogeny, all this stuff. Um, and so then I got to know their names. And when you, you know, knowing names of plants for me is like you're meeting a friend and now you know their name. But more than that, and you know this, Rich, that you, you know a whole lot more about the plant. Um, you know, before, before I went on this bicycle trip, we used to go to the woods and dig our own sassafras roots. You make sassafras tea out of it. Which, by the way, when you buy sassafras tea these days, it's not real sassafras because somebody called it a narcotic. So, anyway, so, so I always knew the plant name, um, and we, we learned a few along the way, and I got to see, I mean, most of the plants I knew along the way, but you get to see them in their real, in, in situ, in real life. Um, anyway, that answer? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, 
Did you ever find anything to eat along the way, like from the trees, from the... I did that in Hawaii, but not so much on this trip. Okay. <laughs> um, let me think about that for a second. Maybe we found, oh yeah, 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 actually in the Rockies, we had strawberries, thimbleberries, gooseberries. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, I even ate some ceanothus one time. Really? Yeah. I'm not supposed to eat it though. <laughs> So we left East Orange, New Jersey on uh, April 16th, the day after tax day. We were going to leave on tax day, sort of symbolic. And um, we arrived in San Francisco on at the beginning of Labor Day weekend. So it was five months. Well, that's four and a half, but then getting home was another, you know, a little more time. So it was five months from beginning to end. Um, and again, we only spent, you know, I'd say three plus months of that in the saddle. You know, a lot of times we meet people, we, we get invited to people's homes for the weekend, or we met really cool people in different places, and then we'd be backpacking. So that was sort of on and off, which was great for us. Um, you know, it gets it. Someone puts you up for the night. Oh, do you have a do you have a washing machine? Yeah. Can we do laundry? Yeah. Can we take a shower? And nowadays, you know, like Kent Johnson, right? They have these bike setups now. This, by the way, this was early in this was early in bike tripping. Okay, there was a book that had just come out called Bike Tripping by Tom Cuthbertson, and it's sort of a it's sort of a how-to, but it's really there's a lot about like bicycle repair. And I was the designated mechanic, by the way, so I got I learned a lot about bikes and actually had to do a lot of you know, I had to rebuild wheels. Um, changing flats and spokes was very mundane. But at that time, there weren't many people doing this. So we met a few in the Shenandoahs. When we left the Shenandoahs, okay, we did not see another person traveling on a bicycle until we were in Colorado. And in fact, when we did, it was like, wow, is that another biker? So that's a big distance. Let me show you. Yeah. We were the only ones that were on the road. Now, we're on back roads mostly. Uh, you know, we didn't know there were interstates. In fact, it's a cool story. Interstate 15, we got to ride on Interstate 15 in Montana before it was open to the public. And I don't want to tell you about that experience because to me it's priceless and it's in the book and you'll have to read it. But it was a rare experience because we were on a freeway with no cars. But interstates were still new then. Anyway, yes, Evan. You ever run into the other kind of cyclists, motorcyclists? Yeah, but even then there weren't as many of them. We did run into um, more dangerous vehicles. Um, you know, trucks that move mobile uh, move these mobile homes. The most dangerous of all were the loggers. I was almost killed by a log. Logging truck. And when I the book came out, Carolyn mentioned that one of her friends knew someone who was killed by a logger, like maybe in the same area. You know, these trucks are so big and the road is so small. So I, I, I've yet to count how many times I almost got killed on this trip. Oh, and, you know, you're 24, you feel immortal. If you ride a bike today, what do you wear on your head? Huh. Yeah. We did not wear helmets. Wow. wow. We just didn't. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, remember cars before seat belts? Yeah. yeah. Only only the bike racers wore those back then. So, yes? I was told by the person who knew, can you think of the one person who survived getting hit by a logger? Who was it? Can you think of the one person who survived getting hit by a logger? He said that the logger, um, Yeah, you know they they would um, they would sound they would lean on their air horn, and uh, you just had to know that you were to get out of the way. Uh, and and you know if you ask me, in these roads there should not be trucks that big on these roads. I mean they would take up almost the whole road. A car would have a hard time. There. So anyway, there was another question. Sure. Uh, 